My sheep hear my voice, says the Lord. I know them and they follow me. Oh, come, let us worship. Familiar enough with the tune 
And if you're not, don't worry. It's fairly easy to follow. It is. You could sing it too, I think. All right, so the glory. Glory to God in the
Elijah meets God at Horeb. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. This morning we have two psalms appointed for our service. Psalms 42 and 43 found on page 758 of the Book of Alternative Services. I invite you to please stand. And this morning as we have two psalms, we'll pray them by the full verse. As the deer longs for the water brooks, so long is my soul for you, O God. My soul is a thirst for God, a thirst for the living God. When shall I come to appear before the presence of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while all day long they say to me, Where now is your God? I pour out my soul when I think of these things. God made the multitude and led me into the house of God. With the voice of praise and thanksgiving among those who keep holy day. Why are you so full of heaviness to my soul? And why are you so much to within me? Put your trust in God, for I will yet give thanks to him who is the help of my countenance and my God. My soul is heavy within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan and from the feet of my heart among the heights of Herman. One deep calls to another in the noise of your cataracts. All your rapids and floods have gone over me. The Lord reigns the sun and the sea of the daytime. In the night season, the sun is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to the God of my strength, Why have you forgotten me? And why do I go so heavily while the enemy oppresses me? While my bones are being broken, my enemies mock me to my face. All day long they mock me and say to me, Where now is your God? Why are you so full of greatness to my soul? And why are you so despised to me? Put your trust in God, for I will yet give thanks to him who is the help of my countenance and my God. Together let us pray. Gracious God, in the night of distress we forget the days of sun and joy. Even when we do not know your presence, preserve us from the dark torrent of despair. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Give judgment for me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. Deliver me from the deceitful and the wicked. For you are the God of my strength. Why have you put me from you? And why do I go so heavily while the enemy oppresses me? Send out your light and your truth, that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. That I may go to the altar of God, to the God of my joy and gladness, and on my heart I will give thanks to you, O God, my God. Why are you so full of heaviness, O my soul? And why are you so disquieted within me? Put your trust in God, for I will yet give thanks to him, who is the 
help of my countenance and my God. And together, God of mercy, mercy, deliver those who are weighed down by fear and depression, and give them the joy of gladness in your presence. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Our New Testament reading is taken from Galatians 3. <coughs> now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A gradual hymn is in the spirit of praise, folks. <coughs> Number 168, As the Deer. We stand and sing together and remain standing for the gospel reading of the call.
For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him, he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would not break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then the people of the surrounding country, the Gerasenes, asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from the demons had got begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your own and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated, and I wonder if some of the smaller and medium-sized people would come up to the front. I think the van is ready. How are you doing today, the van? There's a couple more, I think, coming from the back. If you have to bring your mom or your dad with you, that's okay. All right. All right, this is a good crowd today. All right. So, all right. If you could climb up this way, if you want to come on, sit with us, whatever, wherever she needs to be. All right, so I wanted to ask, as I often do, you guys probably know this, I often start with a question. So today's question is, can you remember a time when you were scared? Have you ever been scared? Even a little bit of anything? When the power went out, that was kind of scary. Because <laughs> it's hard to get your phone to work again. Anything else? Any other comments? Oh, that's a handy thing to have. Well, that's a handy to have. So you don't, you're stuck completely dark. That's good to have. That's a good light to have. <coughs> Well, I've been scared a couple times, but I can't, nothing, I've never had anything really bad happen, but sometimes you just think, oh, oh. like sometimes <coughs> if I'm driving in the winter time, and, and, you, and you, it's slipperier than you think. I remember one time I was going down a very steep hill in Edmonton, and it was very icy and snowy, and, and I realized that I couldn't, yes. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, it was slippery, I couldn't get my car to stop, and there was somebody in front of me. And he was stuck, and I wasn't. <laughs> and so for about this long, it was kind of scary, because I thought, uh-oh, this is not going to be good. But I actually managed to steer the car into the deep snow, and it stopped. So that was pretty close. But um, so. My book got stopped. Yeah? So, but sometimes we have... So in the readings that we read from the Bible today, we've got some... One of the guys, Elijah, he's the guy from the Old Testament, he was very scared. You know why he was very scared? Because there was a bad queen, a mean queen, and she was really, really angry with him. And you know what the mean queen said to the army? You guys go out and find them and tell them 
That's a pretty horrible thing, isn't it? Can you imagine how scared you'd be if you had a whole army coming after you? That's how scared he was. So he was pretty scary with a whole army after you if you're only one person. Don't you think? So he ran away into the wilderness. He ran, he ran away. Well, your socks got socks? I don't, think I, I don't think I understood that. Anyway, he ran away. I don't know if he had socks on, but, but he ran away to the mountain and there was all kinds of noise and a big... Have you ever been out in a big storm when it's all crashing and the wind and there's thunder and lightning and all that stuff? That's what was happening. So not only did the poor guy have, have the Queen's army chasing him, he was in the middle of a big storm up on a mountain. That's very bad, right? And you know what happened? He was waiting to say, where's God going to be here? And then God showed up. But you know what? In the middle of all that loud stuff and all the scary stuff, God was there all along with him. And that's part of the point of that reading. Because it talks about all these big, noisy, scary, crashy things. And then it said, God was there in a still, small voice. So in the middle of all that crazy stuff, God was there with him. That's what we're looking at today. Let's pray. Thank you, God. For, thank you, God, for being with us in scary times. For being with us in scary times. For being with us in happy times. For being with us in happy times. In happy times. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, there's Sunday schools shut down for the summer, so you get to stay upstairs. Well, that's pretty cool. You get to hear the long version of that, <laughs> along with the adults. Okay, so I'll just go back to your seats. I speak to the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Elijah, as you now know, was running away. He was running away from the reality of his life. He was scared, and he had every reason to be. Elijah was zealous for God, and he made some people mad, really mad. And they had an army, and they were ticked, I guess would be the pleasant way to describe that. Queen Jezebel. There is a contest, and you can go back a chapter to and read it. It's quite exciting, really. On the top of Mount Carmel, between God and the gods of the king and queen, the, the Baals, the other gods. And God demonstrated that the other gods were false, to put it mildly. They made a pile of wood, and then they called on those other gods to light, the, 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 to light it on fire. And nothing happened. And then Elijah teased them, and he said, Oh, where are your gods? Maybe they went out to the bathroom. I'm not making that up. It's in the Bible. And then he took his pile of wood and he doused it with water. And then he prayed and, and God poured down fire from heaven and, and it burned. And after that, of course, Elijah and the people executed the priests of the false gods. There were some hard edges back in it, those days. But Jezebel, the queen, was more than a little annoyed that all her priests had been slaughtered. So she vowed that she would do the same thing to Elijah that he had done to her priests. So she would hunt him down and see him killed as well. This was the reality from which Elijah was running. And he was running for his life. He really was. He made the powers of evil mad and they were retaliating. They were tracking him down to kill him, so they sought, he sought to escape that. The real life for Elijah was that the queen wanted his head. In the past, Elijah had needed God and God had answered his prayer with fire from heaven. But after the smoke cleared, he saw no sign of God. All he saw was Jezebel's army charging at him. So he did what most of us would do. He panicked and he ran away. <coughs> but we don't just run away from something. You run to something. And Elijah was no different. He ran to a cave in the wilderness on Mount Horeb. And he came there seeking safety. The wilderness, in the Old Testament and in parts of the New Testament, when people seek safety, when the people of Israel want to go to a place where they can connect with God and be safe, they usually go to the wilderness. 
Because in the wilderness, God had cared for Israel and given them manna and food and water. And on Mount Horeb, God had spoken to the people of Israel and given them the law. It seemed like a good place to go in the, the circumstances. And so Elijah, who was afraid with good reason, remembered that God had cared for God's people in the wilderness. So we ran to the wilderness. There were no Jezebels and false gods to deal with. So, so off he goes. And when he got there, God said, What are you doing here? This isn't where you're supposed to be. You should be proclaiming my word and working my deeds in the face of evil, not running in fear of it. Elijah was seeking to escape and hide in a comfortable past. But God says, I'm in the present, as unpleasant as that may be for you. God was in the midst of the turmoil that Elijah was running from. God had been there all along, but Elijah had failed to see it. So he ran from the reality of his life, but God met him where he was. He ran to the cave of a familiar past out of fear. He was running from the present past that God had given him. But God followed him there. And God cared for him there. And God spoke to him. Jonah had pretty much the same experience, but that's a different sermon when that one comes up. You see, sometimes the way God speaks is as important as what God says. And, and the, the reading goes, there was a great wind, but God was not in the wind. And there was an earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. There is a great fire, but God was not in the fire. But there was a silence, and God was there in the silence. You see, God doesn't always speak to us in great and dramatic and miraculous ways. Sometimes God does. But often God speaks to us out of the mundane and the ordinary. Elijah Snow saw no great pillar of smoke and fire he saw no manna from heaven, no parting of the Red Seas. There is no divine hand carving commandments in stone. There are no rocks gushing forth living water. He ran to the wilderness seeking those things. Instead, he found God in the ordinary, in the still small voice, in the ordinary stuff. It turned out, and this I think is part of the point, that God's thundering voice was there all the time in the silence, in the still small voice in his day-to-day -day life. Hold that thought because we're going to come back to it. Most of us, I'm assuming, or all of us at some point have experienced a summer thunderstorm. And I actually, I had one out here, so maybe it didn't work differently here, but I don't think they do. They can come up suddenly and without warning. And, and out in the prairies, oh my goodness, when they come up, you wouldn't believe it sometimes. One minute, the sun is shining and the weather is clear, then all of a sudden a strong wind comes up and you hear thunder in the distance and see the lightning and before you know it, the bottom falls out and the sky becomes dark. And it does that weird thing where the sky sometimes turns kind of green. I don't know if you've ever seen that, that's weird. The sky turns this kind of yellowy green color, like a bruise or something. But we sort of understand how that works, at least the people who study weather. In the summer, the heat and the sun cause water to evaporate quickly and humidity rises to the point where the hot air has all the water it can hold. And when it starts to cool off, the, 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 the cooler air can't hold as much water as the hot air, so it starts to condense. And the quicker it happens, the more static electricity builds up. And so you get lightning and thunder and rain all at the same time. And it keeps on until it gets itself back into balance. I'm sure if there's any meteorologist here, I got part of that one. I apologize. But we sort of understand the process. We know how it works. And, and, but we can't really stop it. I don't care how smart you are. If you're out in a thunderstorm, you're going to get wet. And, and, and it's going to be a little bit frightening. Because if you're smart enough to know what's happening, you don't want to be out in the middle of it, especially out in the middle of a field or something. Sometimes you can predict it, sometimes you can prepare for it, but it could happen. So, so why am I talking about storms? Well, because there's at least four different storms in the reading for today. And if we count just a few verses just before what was read. The Sea of Galilee that Jesus is out on 
is really kind of a lake. And, and, and it's a very hot part of the world, and it's a very dry part of the world. So as you can imagine, you get storms there very quickly. And the fishermen would have known about that. And they would have known storms, and they would have known how to know they were coming. So one day, just before the passage that was read, Jesus and the disciples are crossing the lake, and the storm arose. And Jesus was asleep in the boat. And the storm came up, and it was a big one, and even the fishermen were frightened, and they, they woke Jesus up, probably to see if he could grab a bucket and start bailing, or, or something, or help them somehow. But instead of that, Jesus speaks to the storm. Luke says he rebukes it, and the storm stopped. And the disciples look at him and they go, who is this? That even the, the winds and the waves obey him. So that's the first storm, just before the passage that we read. The second storm is not as obvious, but it's there nonetheless. And it has to do with where they were. The Sea of Galilee was on the border between the Jewish region of Galilee and the region of the Gerasenes. And the passage starts off with Jesus saying, let's go over to the other side. And that's when the other storm started. The disciples, of course, were used to ministering to their fellow Jews. They understood them. They knew what they were like. They knew what the rules were. But on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, they weren't Jewish. They were Gentiles. They were different. And, and surely they were frightened by the storm. But even before that, it was kind of daunting to go over to the other side where, where the people weren't the same. Following Jesus was clearly going to take them out of their comfort zone. Add to that the storm, and you can imagine what was going through the disciples' minds. Fear of the elements and fear of people who are different. No wonder Jesus chastised them for their lack of faith. And in the midst of the storm, says Jesus says, peace be still. It calmed the sea. I don't know if it calmed the disciples. It might not have done that well yet. They're probably still wondering what they got themselves into. Because Luke says that they were still afraid. And they're wondering, like, who is this guy who does all these things? Third storm. That was what met them on the other side. If they weren't afraid before, then they must have been when the boat had landed. The first thing they run into, of course, is a herd of pigs. And that's a pretty sure sign that they weren't among Jewish people anymore. They would have been unclean animals. But they also met a demon-possessed man who met them and fell at Jesus' feet. Now we can try to analyze what sort of mental illness he had, but clearly there was something very wrong with this man, which resulted in living in the cemetery among the graves. And, and he came running up to Jesus, and the disciples had been saying, the disciples had been wondering who Jesus was, after he calmed the storm, but the demon-possessed man knew exactly who he was. It's an interesting point here. This demon-possessed, this crazy person, if you will, comes up to Jesus and calls him the Son of the Most High God. This man, it's hard to imagine the suffering that he'd been through, but he sees Jesus and he knows who he's dealing with. And just as Jesus had rebuked the storm, he rebuked the demons, he cast them into the pigs, and the pigs ran down the bank and were drowned in the sea, and the man was fine. Somebody said that's the first thing, that's how you get devil ham. But, <laughs> but the storm was over for this man. That great storm that had afflicted him for years was over, and he was fine, and he could return home and, and rebuild his life. And that takes us to the fourth storm. The first was the physical one. The second was the emotional storm in the disciples. The third was the psychological storm in this man. The fourth one was really a social storm because the people of that region had tried to control this man with ropes and chains and they saw what had happened. And the swine herders had run to the village and told the people. And the people of the village came and they saw the man clothed and in his right mind. And they were frightened. If he, they, had not been, they had not been able to control this man. They had not been able to do anything to help him. And here this guy comes across the, the lake in a boat from the other side. And he calms him and heals him with just his voice. 
And they were every bit as frightened as the disciples had been when Jesus calmed the storm on the sea. So out of their fear, they told Jesus to go away. If he could control this man possessed by demons, what else could he do? He already destroyed a whole herd of pigs. What else might he do? So they told us to go away. We live, for better or for worse, in the time when there are issues debated and things to propose and things that the church has to wrestle with that would have never seen the light of day in previous times. We live in a time when there are things you can read about in the newspapers or we don't even really have them anymore. You can read about them on the internet that we can't even imagine happening in earlier, simpler times. And it's tempting in the midst of that to go back to the simpler times, to go back to when it was all clear and we didn't have to figure out all these complicated things. We didn't even have to think about them. But that's not what God's calling us to do. God's calling us to brave the storms, to be there when it gets rough, because that's where God is going to be. Just like Elijah ran away to the mountain to be safe, and God meets him there and says, why are you here? Go back to work. It's really tempting for the church, particularly, to try to be a comfortable, safe place where we don't have to think about things that we'd rather not think about. That's not where we find God at work. We find God at work in the hard stuff, in the complicated stuff, in the stormy stuff. Many of us, if we take our faith seriously, are going to end up spending more time out of our comfort zones than we like. I'm getting a little older, and I prefer comfort to discomfort, I'll be honest with you. I like it when everybody's happy. I like it when everybody agrees. I don't like it when, when we talk about things that not everyone's on the same page about. Sometimes it'd be nice if we could just hide in the cleft in the rock like Elijah. But we can't. <coughs> Think of all the storms in that country, and yet God is there. Jesus is there right through them. And it's through the storms that healing is found. God calls us out of the places where we're comfortable and into the places where there's noise and fear and sin and people who need God and people who need us and the things that we're able to offer. Our Christian journey is, make, is meant to take us into places of rest and stillness for a time, but then back out into places of need and hard realities, because that's where we really find God, just like Elijah did, just like the disciples did. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to, to, as I do from time to time, give a word of reassurance to parents with, with kids. They are, you have no idea how wonderful it is to have them here. And, and when they make a little bit of noise, trust me, there are people here who love that. You might get the odd grump, that's okay. Don't worry about the grumps. But, 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 but it is just so, because when they go squawk, you know what, there's people here who have grandchildren in other parts of the country or other parts of the world that they miss, me for instance, and it's wonderful to see them. So we're really glad you're here. So, so don't worry about them. They're, they're just as much, they're part of the storm sometimes, but that's part of the deal. So, so don't panic. If, if you think, besides it's about 10 times as noisy to you as it is to anybody else. So we're delighted that they're here. On that note, we move on page 189 in the Green Prayer Books. We stand together and affirm the faith we share in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He 
you will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We move to our time of prayer. You may sit, stand, or kneel as you find most helpful.
Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue on page 191 of the Green Prayer Books. On page 191. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your face. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness. And keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We stand together for the peace. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. We share God's peace with one another.
by lots of helpers today. and nation 
may share the banquet you have promised. Through Christ, with, with Christ, and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, Creator of all. And as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
anyway, <laughs> good thing I'm not in charge of that part. <laughs> in any case, it's a community that, that, that was resettled, and, and Alan would know because he has a cabin there. And the, the, but the number of people have cabins there. There's a church there that's been rebuilt over the years. And so we're going to have a picnic and an outing and a church service there. And that's the plan. So you can't drive there. There's no road. And you could swim, but it's a long way. So there's two lists. There's a list of people who would like to go but don't have a boat handy. And, and so we have those people listed. And then we have, hopefully, nobody's put their name yet, but hopefully get some names on the other list, which is the people who have boats and wouldn't mind and have room for folks. Except nobody has a boat. We're not boating. But, but we'll see what happens. But, but this is kind of an experiment. Um, and I recognize that, that it, we're sort of planning on having a picnic around lunchtime, and, and so the goal is to be there somewhere around noon. We haven't really, we're not planning to work it out in great detail, but there'll be a picnic, there'll be some time to explore a little bit, some time to relax, and a church service as well, so it should be a really good day. Um, some of the boats may be leaving from Clarenville, and they'll have to leave earlier because it's quite a ways around for those who can't go under the bridge. Um, and some people may be leaning from Petley, some people may be leaning from Burgoyne's Cove. Someone's trying to track, someone's got a line on a long liner to leave from, uh, from Burgoyne's Cove, which I think is a hoop to go load up a bunch of people on a long liner and chuck them down the coast. So we'll see how that goes. I, I think if Charlotte wants something to happen, I think Charlotte will get it to happen. Those of you who know Charlotte, you'll know what I'm talking about. And there may even be folks leading from down on the arm. So, so the for departure times and, and where from may vary. But if you're interested, put your name up there. If you have a boat and a couple spare seats in it, put your name there. We'll sort it out and do the best we can to get as many people there as possible. So that's the sign-up list at the back. And I think I'm really looking forward to it. The only other couple of things are that the, uh, the kitchen cleanup is on hold again because a number of the folks who are part of the kitchen cleanup aren't available tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. I know many of you are just waiting for the kitchen cleanup tomorrow. You're going to have to wait a little bit longer. And many of you will know will have known Charlie Cox, young Charlie, I think as he's often described. He spent some of his time here as a theological student and a very nice young man. He's been ordained, actually he's a deacon. I think, uh, on the 26th, whatever day that is. Wednesday? Wednesday. It's 7 o'clock at the Cathedral in Gander. So if you met Charlie, or even if you just feel like a trip to Gander, uh, that's at 7 o'clock Wednesday evening in Gander. There's another guy that I can't didn't write his name down. I feel kind of badly about that. And the other guys. But uh, let me know. I have one or two spare seats in my car. And if you feel like tagging along, we can do that. Let me know. Uh, other than that, I think it's the stuff in the bulletin. Did I forget anything else? All right. I think that's it. So we'll stand for the blessing and then move to our final hymn. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is out of the praise books number 143, Rock of Ages.